Great. So I am Ross Yelsey. I'm an assistant director of admission and marketing at Columbia Journalism School. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this Friday to learn more about application tips, which is a really important subject. The great thing is, is most of our programs won't be uh, having a deadline for submitting an application until December or in some cases January. So you will have a good amount of time after viewing this, talking to us today to uh, continue working on an application. So no rush to like, you know, totally implement everything we talk about today into your app, but you'll have a good amount of time to start thinking about the things we discussed in today's session. You'll have time to uh, check in with us again. We'll have a lot of drop-in sessions and opportunities to ask individualized questions of us. So this is a great way to get the conversation started, but it's nice that you know you'll have a good amount of time, many, many weeks to uh, work on the different elements we're gonna talk about today. I'd like to introduce my uh, colleague, uh, David Hooker. David, you want to say hello to everybody? Yes. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for joining Ross and I today for um, some application tips. Hopefully, you all have already started the application. Um, if you haven't, you can start doing that right away. Um, yeah. Thank you for joining us and um, look forward to hearing your questions um, that you'll be able to post to us um, after we give our presentation. So again, thanks for joining us. Yes, and as David mentioned, we're gonna have a presentation, go over a lot of the key elements. Hopefully we'll address a lot of questions you might have already, um, and then we'll open up the chat and uh, just know that certain things will go over in different webinars coming up. So if you have questions about educational financing, we'll have some webinars coming up, so stay tuned. So we'll talk more about that in detail. So if you have questions on that, I'd save those for an upcoming webinar or anything super specific. We'll likely be able to address that more in a drop-in session that we have every Wednesday. Um, we can go to a Zoom and talk about that. So for those, I just hold on to it, but for anything related to our subject matter today about kind of applications and thinking about the materials and how to assemble everything um, successfully and on time. Uh, we'll be talking about that uh, in the next hour. So I will share my screen here in one second and start our presentation. One second here. Great. Uh, so here's our title, Application Tips. Um, and for those of you who don't know the school, uh, you can see on the right hand side of the screen, this is uh, Pulitzer Hall, where uh, I am right now. Uh, it's uh, not quite so nice looking in real life outside right now, a lot of rain and clouds, but on a good day, it looks like that. And all of our journalism school classes are housed here, all our faculty, all of our students. So in the eight stories of Pulitzer Hall, that's where everything goes on. So we hope a lot of you will apply to become a member of the community that will be in this building uh, in the coming years. And so overall, we're going to do um, kind of th uh, four main kind of aspects of the application process in our application tips uh, presentation today. Those will be kind of some essential application materials, things that you have to uh, put together for the application, no matter what program you'll be uh, applying for. Um, we'll give you some tips about how to prepare a strong application, considering all these different elements and what things to really pay attention to. And then we'll talk over very briefly just the key application dates, which are pretty straightforward. And then we'll go over some common questions that we get pretty frequently year after year, where we can give some kind of lightning round answers to those. And then we will open the chat and take some time Time to answer uh, some of your questions that you may have as well. And just so you know, um, some of you may have already opened an application. As David mentioned, you can open your application now uh, if you want to and select uh, application 2024 in order to uh, apply for the 24-25 year uh, for whatever program uh, you're interested in at the school. This is basically what that page will look like when you open your application. We won't go into every kind of aspect of it in terms of the application itself, but you'll encounter this kind of interface where you'll have um, these little areas on the left where you'll be able to fill out information uh, required uh, for each segment of the application. And we'll talk more in detail about certain ones uh, in the next few minutes. But this is generally what it will look like when you come into the application. And it's pretty straightforward. You can click on all the blue hyperlinked areas, put in the answers, put in the materials, put in the essays or the short answers. And as you go through, it'll let you know what materials are still outstanding. So you know um, if you've submitted all the pieces of the application um, on time. So that's basically what you'll encounter if you haven't already for the application itself. And so starting with the key application materials, we'll start with the essays, because I think that is one of the key aspects of any application to a graduate program, and definitely for the journalism school, because as you might know, we don't um, you know, require any standardized tests like the GRE or anything else for our program. So we're less um, attentive to like uh, test scores or even like GPAs in a, in a school. We'll talk about transcripts a little later, but you know, we don't have cutoffs for numbers, whether it's a GRE score. We're not really interested in GRE scores at all, and we're not 
particularly interested in like having a cutoff for GPA because we know people have great potential in journalism who maybe for whatever reasons didn't perform like super stellar in their undergraduate education or graduate school education. So that won't be the main thing, but it's really the essays we'll be looking at. So for that reason, we'll talk about that first. And so for all master's degree applicants, no matter whether you're applying to the MS, the MA, the MS in data journalism, any of those programs, there's going to be at least two essays you're going to do for sure. And those are the autobiographical essay and the professional essay. And so uh, those should both be no more than 750 words each. So not super long. You don't have to write an extensive, you know, super long essay for each of those, but be concise. But the thing to keep in mind, of course, is that you're going to want to, you know, tell a good um, picture of, give us a good picture of yourself, basically, in both of those autobiographical, you know, tell us about some things that were really meaningful for you in your life so far that maybe motivated you, maybe some journalism or some other stories that you've encountered that have been really um, relevant and motivating for you wanting to do journalism, people in your life, experiences you've had, issues that really motivate you, whatever it is you want us to know, because for most of our programs, we won't be able to interview you um, during the application process to talk over, you know, why you want to come here one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we'd love to have the time, but unfortunately, we have too many applications to be able to do that. So this is a great way just to make a, your mark when people are reading the application to get a sense on who you are, what makes you tick, and what motivates motivates you and why journalism is what you want to do, whether you've been doing it before or whether you're new to it, why you want to do that. And the professional essay is more about what you want to do professionally um, next if you come here. So what can we do at our school to help you achieve what your goals are? What are the things you'd like to take advantage of at the school? Different courses, different training, different faculty you want to work with. Tell us a bit about you know, what you want to do with your kind of career next and how a degree from our school will help you do that in that essay. And for the PhD in communications, um, slightly different, but pretty similar. Uh, personal statement, again, giving you a good sense of like, you know, who you are to this admissions committee. Again, 750 words or fewer for that uh, essay. And then a little different than the professional essay for the PhD applicants is an academic interest essay. So that'll give you the application committee a better sense on your academic interest. So what do you want to research? What do you want to explore if you were doing a doctoral program, which is a very different program than our master's programs, because it's not a professional training program. It is an academic program where you're taking many courses in different disciplines around the university in pursuit of some sort of research interest you have. So tell us a bit about what you want to explore and why this really is something you want to get into for many, many years if you're doing the PhD program uh, for that essay. And then for people who are applying to a specialized master's degree program, and for that, I mean, uh, we do have two specializations within, within the MS program, the MS documentary specialization, the MS investigative specialization within there. We also have a specialized program in a sense called the MS in data journalism, which is focused primarily on uh, data-based reporting. We also have a dual MS in journalism and computer science. And we have the MA program that has four concentrations in it, arts and culture, business and economics, politics and science. So if you are applying to any of those programs, Programs, you will have to do a third essay, also no more than 750, 750 words, 750 words, excuse me, about why you want to apply to a specific area of journalism, uh, whether it's the investigative specialization in the MS, the data degree program, which is going to be very data heavy, uh, or one of the MA concentrations in that subject area, whether it's arts, whether it's business, politics, or science. Tell us why, you know, given all the options at the school, you've decided you really want to focus in on this particular area while you're here. So that would be a third essay that would be prompted if you do want to do a specialized program or a specific uh, kind of area of journalism while you're at the school. For the MS applicants to our broader MS or to the part-time program, you just have to do the two essays that we outlined earlier. And just um, something that comes up a lot with applicants is we get a question very frequently when they start our application where they'll look on the screen. And if you look on our left side screen here, it says essays and there's nothing there. And, they're at, and they ask why why can't I upload my essays? Why can't I start my essays? What you need to do first in order to generate the essay prompts is to uh, put in your program of interest. So on the left-hand side, you see that part. Um, you'll need to click that. You'll need to determine which degree program you're applying to. And then the essays will be generated um, in, uh, you know, in connection to what it is you want to apply for. So if you apply to the MS, you'll get the two prompts. MA three, data journalism three. So um, it'll be contingent on you first putting in that uh, program of interest and then you can start to do the essays within the application. So just do that first and then you'll get those essays and you won't have to check in with us uh, to see where the heck those are. And then we'll talk more about work samples uh, with David. Great, thanks Ross. So for the work samples, um, it's a little bit different for each degree program, but there are some similarities. Um, so we'll go through first the MS, then we'll cover the MA, and then we'll go finish up with the PhD. So for the MS degree, um, you do have to submit three work samples. 
Um, this is a journalism school, so journalism uh, work samples are um, um, more required. It's not required, but it's, you know, that's the highlight. That's what you'll be doing at the journalism school. Um, so for those who don't have journalism experience um, or coming from completely different um, disciplines or uh, different backgrounds, um, you can submit academic work or professional work as well. Um, samples do not have to be published for the MS uh, degree program, and that's the full-time, part-time, or the data program. Um, it does not have to be published, but we are looking for quality writing, um, you know, deep analysis. We want to get a sense of your writing style, how you think. Um, multiple samples can be uploaded too. So if you're having multimedia clips, audio, video, you can also attach that directly to the application. Um, there is a strict guideline for three minutes to um, upload. So if you have more than three minutes, I always recommend students to um, cut their work so that you're only submitting um, the important piece of whether it's an audio clip or a video clip. If you submit something that's like 20 minutes long, um, it's not guaranteed that the reviewers will actually take the time to sit down and review the entire clip. Um, so make sure that if you are submitting um, something that's from a longer piece, just take the time to trim it so that it fits the three minutes um, because you wanna make sure that you're submitting your best work, whether it's a written sample, audio clip, video clip, um, this is how we're evaluating your application. So you wanna make sure you're submitting your best work. Um, if you have a piece where you're not the only person that um, wrote the article, or um, if it's a multimedia clip, you have multiple people, basically you cannot submit that work. It has to be your work. That's what we are evaluating. So if you have a piece that has multiple bylines, unfortunately you cannot submit that for our degree programs. Um, if you have any work that is um, not in English, it has to be translated before you upload it. So please make sure you follow that guideline. Um, and then all of our work, you have to be able to submit everything um, and it cannot be more than 15 pages. So that's the MS in a nutshell. For the MA, it's pretty much the same guidelines as before. Um, the difference is, um, the MA program, we're expecting you to already have journalism experience, um, usually anywhere from three to five years of experience already. So the requirements for the writing samples and the audio clips, it's a little bit different. We're expecting them to be more polished. We're expecting them to also be um, work samples that you submitted either professionally or if you worked at your school newspaper. Um, so my rec recommendation is if you are thinking about applying to MA program and you don't necessarily have a lot of experience, when you're submitting your samples, if you're struggling to submit a sample um, that is journalistic in nature, um, you're, you're thinking about submitting, let's say like a book report or something you did in a specific class, my recommendation is think about the MS program because you don't have to have experience to apply to the MS. Um, so that's in a nutshell for the MA program. We're looking for polished work. We're looking for work um, where we where a student has actually submitted journalism work where it's multiple sources, not just one. Um, PhD program, academic, research. That's the type of program this is. So that's the type of work that we're looking for, written samples. Um, this is scholarly in its approach. Um, again, we have had students who have applied to the PhD program with a journalism background. Um, so um, you can submit work that's um, that you've done for um, work, professional. Um, but again, we're looking for scholarly work. Um, the difference with that is you can actually submit a little bit more, um, two samples instead of three. Um, up to 15 to 20 pages. Um, and again, but it should all, for all these three programs, this is all work that you have done on your own. Mm -hmm. It's a group project, something you've done with multiple people, that is not acceptable. Great.
and I will talk about the letters of recommendation. So um, on top of the three work samples, the number three should be pretty familiar. There'll be three work samples and also three letters of recommendation that we look for for all um, applications uh, to the programs. Um, so for th this, um, we have a couple kind of a new newer rule, which is if you are fewer than five years out of your last academic degree program, we ask that you have at least one academic reference uh, writer. So that means like, if you just finished your bachelor's degree a few years ago, if you are currently in your senior year or going into your senior year of uh, college and uh, you're applying this season, um, that's great. Uh, we just ask that at least one of the people that be your recommender be an academic person, whether that's a professor or someone who's like worked with you as a supervisor for some other um, kind of venture at the university or college you're at, that would be fine. Um, and then for the other two, um, or other three, depending on where you are in your career, uh, that can be a mix of academic or professional uh, supervisors or teachers as your recommenders. So people sometimes ask, is there a right or wrong combination? Can I have like two academic ones and one professional or three academic ones or two professional, one academic? Any combination is fine in that case. Um, you could have three of one thing if you've been out of school for much longer than five years, if it's three professional references, that's fine af after the five-year cutoff of being done with your last degree. Um, so, but the real criteria we look for is people that know your work well, whether it's academic work, whether it's professional work, who've been able to supervise that. For, for that reason, we ask that it not be people who are your, say, colleagues. Say if you're working at a company and someone has basically the same general kind of status role as you, they're kind of like a coworker, and they don't supervise your work, they don't evaluate your work, we would ask that they not be asked to write a letter for you. And similarly, we ask for that for people who maybe are like family friends. Sometimes we get letters being like, you know, this person is my, my godson and they're really, you know, great. And I think they'll do well at your school. I'm sure that's all true. Uh, but we ask that it's somebody uh, that actually has been able to evaluate your work in either a professional or an academic context. And that can be from many years back. In some cases, some people might've worked really closely with a supervisor or a, um, or a professor several years ago. And it doesn't matter in terms of exactly the recency of your uh, work with them, as long as they are able to write a detailed letter about you. Um, and so that's the key thing is like the quality of what they can say in that letter about details about what they've seen you do in the past and what they can see you potentially doing in the future um, with a degree at Columbia. So that's really what we'll want to see in those letters. They don't need to be journalists or journalism professors necessarily. Sometimes we get questions like that, like, oh, is it okay? This person actually, you know, is, uh, you know, a person I work for at a business that's not related to journalism or a professor I had in a uh, economics class or a history class. That's all fine. So don't feel concerned that if that person isn't necessarily related to journalism, they sh they can't write the letter. They certainly can if you feel like they know you very well. Um, a tip that we'll go over a little bit again in the future is that you should I always, you know, if you have the, the person in mind that you want to have write a reference letter, contact them now um, as early as you can, because it's always great to give them more time to write letters. The way that our application works is you can uh, put them into our system as early as you like, and they will get notified um, if you put their email into the system to begin writing that letter. And that will give them, you know, potentially several months uh, to get that letter done rather than like waiting to the last minute and giving them only a few weeks, especially around the holidays and the end of the uh, fall semester where things are a little busy uh, for most people. So the more time you can give them, the better. And you don't need to submit your application first in order to generate the recommendation letter um, ask. So you could start that now, even if you're not going to actually submit your application for several more weeks. So start that as soon as you can. We also ask for the recommenders that you put their institutional email addresses, if they have them, um, as a recommender email contact um, address. So that means if they're a professor currently, uh, put their EDU um, address or whatever that might be in another country. If it is someone who works for a company, um, that you use their company address for whatever that is. We get some people we know that are retired, or maybe they are people that have more of a freelance job and they don't necessarily have an institutional address, that's okay. But if you are asking someone from a company or from a university or school to write a reference, we do ask that you, um, you know, prioritize their email address that's at that institution as the contact for them. And then over to the resume. All right. So the resume is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, we ask that you submit no more than two pages. Um, a lot of questions that we tend to get is, you know, what's, what style, what format. Um, we don't really have a requirement. Um, just make sure it's clear, it's concise, it's uniform. You know, make sure the font size uh, for the entire resume is all the same. Um, just make sure it looks nice. Bullets, uh, points, bullet points. Um, please make it legible, easy to read. Um, and then you also want to make sure you highlight 
both your academic and professional highlights. I know there's a, um, we get also a lot of questions about folks who have, um, you know, other accomplishments or certificates or awards that they've received. And they, they want to figure out where to put that in the application. A great spot is on the resume. So um, make sure it provides your academic and professional career highlights that you want us to know about. Great, and then we're off to transcripts, academic transcripts. And this always gets to be a fun uh, conversation. I know it's sometimes a little bit of a, a, a kind of a burden sometimes to have to notify different schools to get transcripts uh, for your work uh, to put into the application. So this is another part of the application. We always say, get started with this as soon as you can, if it seems like you'll have to ask uh, one or more institutions to provide some transcripts. So we will need transcripts of all of your academic work at the college level or above. So it means like, Anything you've done, uh, you know, whether it's your bachelor's or it's equivalent, if you have other graduate degrees, we'll want to see those. And it also includes summer programs that you might have done uh, while you were in college or after, uh, you know, whether they're language courses, study abroad programs, whatever they were other graduate programs you've done um, and schools that you've attended, but maybe where you didn't earn a degree, if you transferred from one school to another or multiple schools uh, you transferred from until you finish your degree, we'll wanna see transcripts from all of those institutions. Even if uh, you know you earned your degree at only one of them, if you went to two schools, three schools, four schools before that, we'll wanna see all of those uh, marks that you got at those schools. So just get the transcripts from everything uh, up front, and that will save some time because we'll notify people if they're missing something that you know they indicated they went to a certain school for a summer abroad we'll get back in touch later and you know it'll be a headache it'll be during the winter that you'll have to go find these things so i'd say start now and get all these materials uploaded or sent to us as soon as you can and then this will be out of your kind of your uh, your hair right away and so that's my advice on that front and for the application process copies of these materials are sufficient so that means if you already have like a PDF that you got from your registrar when you graduated um, from whatever program that you just have a copy of um, you can upload that right away into the application, that will be sufficient. Any scans you have, if you can scan a paper uh, transcript, um, that'd be fine. Some screenshots are okay if it captures the name of the institution and the you know the grades and all of that. Um, and But we will require the official versions if you are in a happy instance, admitted and choose to come to Columbia in the future. At that point, say after we notify people of admissions decisions and you choose to enroll, we will ask that you get uh, actual copies sent from these institutions to us directly. But for this application process, which you need to do this fall, you can do this all through the copies if you have those already. And you can upload those copies directly into the application. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. And also, if you need to order them and just have them sent to us uh, right away uh, electronically, you can have them sent. But make sure that they're sent to our apply.journalism at columbia.edu address and not to other Columbia schools. Sometimes people just indicate Columbia University as a recipient for uh, various transcripts. Those are probably going to be lost in the ether because it's a big university system. There's many schools here. And if you just send them generally to Columbia, it's very unlikely we can find them on our end. So always make sure that if it asks you where they should be sent to, that is the journalism school, or if it's not a possibility to indicate journalism school, this email address as the recipient for those transcripts. And again, this will be for all the work you've done college level and above. And we also get questions if you're watching this um, and you are currently in your final year of your bachelor's degree or whatever its equivalent is right now, it's certainly fine that you um, upload a transcript of all of your work up to the time you're applying. So that might mean um, your fall grades are still pending. Um, you can upload that um, as long as you know that you will finish your bachelor's degree or its equivalent by uh, the time you would enroll at our school. Our school always starts in August of the next year. Um, so you can upload that. So don't be concerned if you're applying and you haven't quite gotten that final transcript because you haven't finished your degree quite yet. You're welcome to put in your current you know, pending resume, or sorry, pending transcript of all of your uh, academic work up to now. And we can accept that for the application purposes. And so I told you that I will show you how to upload your uh, transcripts as well if you have copies. It's not always that easy to figure this out. I, I totally understand when you are in our application system. So this will be under the education section. Um, and you'll see in that area, it asks you to uh, click where that red arrow is pointing for add institution, where you can add all the schools that you've attended up till now at the college level or above. Um, and you'll need to put those all in. You can put the degree. If there's no degree, you can say an A and the dates attended for the school. And when you do that for each institution, um, there will be this kind of box that pops up um, in the screen. And it's not totally apparent at first, but when you go to the very bottom of that box, there'll be an area where you can choose a file to upload as the transcript from that school. So that's where it says PDF or scan pages, choose file, um, and you can choose that file, 
upload that document to attach that specific school that you're adding as an institution. And if for whatever reason you need to have something sent into us independently, you don't have it in, in your possession to upload and you need to send it to us via email, send it to us and we will be able to add that later to the application. So for anything you have in your possession, upload that, have it easily sent in by yourself into the application. And for other materials you have to have sent from the institution to us, we can take care of that on our end, but make sure you add the institution, even if you aren't able to upload the transcript as one of the institutions you've attended um, in that section uh, for this. A quick tip for that too, the, the pop-up box. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen it once in a while. Is if you have um, your pop-up, I guess, blocked, for your browser or whatever. So because it's a pop-up, that box won't show up. So make sure if you're at that page and you're clicking on the Add Institute button and you don't see the pop-up, um, just disarm the pop-up and it should do, once you do it again, it should come up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And then language test stores. Okay, so we get a lot of questions about um, this part of the application process. So I will try to demystify this as much as I can. So we have, for my international students or applicants, um, we have the master's degree program and the PhD program. So they are all lumped together. So MS, MA, MS in data, specializations, all falls under the MS master's degree uh, programs. And then the PhD is separate. So there's two separate requirements for TOEFL or IELTS for both of those. Um, program. So we'll start with all of the master degree requirements. So for my international students, where English is not your first language and you did not complete your bachelor's degree, and that means every class that you took was in English, the medium of instruction in that university has to be in English. If both of those requirements are not met, then you would have to take the TOEFL or the IELTS. Um, and then the scores are, the TOEFL score is 114, the IELTS is eight. Um, so take a closer look at the PhD. All my folks who are interested in applying to the PhD program, it is different. And the difference is, if English is not your first language, and even if English was the medium of instruction for your bachelor's degree, you still have to take the TOEFL. So those are the two differences between if you're applying to our master's degree programs and to our PhD programs. Um, for the master's degree, I'll just say it again. <clears throat> if you did not complete, if English was not the language of instruction, you have to take, take it for the master's degree program. Mm -hmm. For your PhD, it does not matter. Even if English was a medium of language, for your bachelor's degree, you will still be required to take the TOEFL and IELTS. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also add in that um, for both of those exams, the TOEFL and the IELTS, we are also still accepting the take the at-home academic versions. So you can schedule those at your convenience. I always recommend that if you know you have to take the TOEFL or the IELTS, those can take time. That's one of the things in the application process that you don't have control over. So sign up for that now so that you can take the test and have that information before the December 15th deadline. I know it's early, it's not even October, but October is only two or three days away. Mm -hmm. So sign up for those tests now if you have to take them. Good advice. I know it's not what everyone wants to hear, but it's always good since we're still in September for a, a couple more days. <laughs> that there's still a good amount of time to, to schedule one of these if you really need to. And we don't really offer waivers for that, as we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but for the master's, one question we get sometimes is like, if you say if Spanish is your first language and you went to an English language university and you maybe you took a one or two foreign language classes in an English language university, like you, you study Japanese for one or two terms, that's okay. That doesn't mean you need to like take the TOEFL or IELTS because you took like a foreign language class if you're in a university that, you know, overall is like taught in English and most of your classes are in English. But if you wanted to study a foreign language as part of some of the classes you took, um, that would be okay. Great point, yeah. Great. 
And then another big thing we get questions about, uh, cause it kind of looms over the, you know, the, the process for anyone applying to our master of science programs is the writing tests. Uh, you might've read about this or seen this indicated as a requirement. It's something that isn't open right now. So it's not something you can, uh, you know, schedule at this moment, uh, but hold tight. We'll be uh, notifying people when it is available. Uh, what will happen is in November or so, we will be sending out information about how to schedule the writing test session. And the writing test can be taken on your computer, wherever you are in the world. So we know like a lot of our applica applicants are in places all over the globe um, and there'll be different time zones. So we'll have a scheduling process where you can schedule to take this on your computer, on your PC, on your laptop, on your Mac, wherever it is, uh, as long as it has a camera and a, um, a microphone on whatever device it is that you're taking it on, you can take it um, yeah, at your convenience, wherever you need to be able to take it. Um, and it will present you, you know, it's not really a test. I know it sounds like a kind of a big, scary part of the, you know, the process, but it's not a test because it doesn't really have a score. There's no score for it. We don't like deduct points off of people's scores because there is no like a uh, total score or maximum score. It's really going to be two or three open-ended questions that ask each uh, person taking it to show how you'll think through a situation, uh, usually a journalistic situation, and convey your thought process about it in writing. And so you'll get uh, two or three prompts. You'll have a few paragraphs to answer probably each. You don't have to write exhaustive essays in response to these prompts, but you know, write a few paragraphs about uh, kind of how you would um, you know um, approach whatever these situations are. And so it's really there to kind of give us a sense on how you think through a situation in a journalistic uh, context context and are able to write up your thoughts clearly. There's no like, you know, again, scoring process either to test your knowledge of current events. So people shouldn't be concerned that they need to like know, uh, you know, exactly, you know, who's the prime minister of some country, what the current legislation, uh, you know, in the U.S. is about, what some sort of treaty is about. It's not going to be that kind of gotcha kind of exam that's going to be like, did they read the news this week or this month? So don't worry about that. Um, and also don't worry about being, you know, super, you know, perfect in all of your prose. It's great if you take care uh, in terms of your writing and make it very clear, but we're not going to be, you know, completely concerned if you like, you know, have a serial comma or a wrongly placed semicolon somewhere. Those aren't the main things. It's overall, there's a holistic understanding of your ability to think through a situation, write about it in a short amount of time, about an hour um, usually to take this. So it's not going to be super long but not super short either we do this because we know a lot of journalists will need to kind of write on their kind of on their toes get things done on deadlines so that's kind of what this exercise is about and again it's taken as part of the application it's not like a kind of the key make it or break it part of the application and one thing to note too it's up in the red writing at the top of this slide is that this is for master program master of science program applicants all of them whether you're applying to the ms general program the documentary specialization the data ms the dual ms the part-time, whatever it is, uh, you'll need to take it. And also, if you're an MA applicant who chooses in the application to be also be considered for the MS, because you've indicated in that box that you want to also be considered for this program, you will also be required to take the writing test in that case. If you're applying to the MA only and you don't want to be considered for the MS, you will not need to take this writing test. So that's um, kind of how this works. And yes, stay, uh, stay posted that we'll be uh, sending out something in um, November. And once you submit your application to give you instructions on how to schedule this, and you should have a good amount of time, several weeks, to find a time that works for you to take the writing test online. Um, it won't tell you there's a only one date you can take it and one time. You'll have like a menu of options on a calendar and you can select the one that works for you in whatever time zone you might be uh, doing this in. And now um, a few hot tips on how to prepare a strong application. And so we kind of went over a lot of this kind of as we went over the materials, but just to reiterate a few key points. Uh, one of the main ones is to focus on those essays, which I went over earlier in the um, presentation today. And so what we really want to see in those essays is to tell us why whatever degree program you're applying to is the right fit for your goals. Because, uh, you know, everything we do here is journalism. So you won't be able to change your major. So we want to know that even if you want to explore various aspects of journalism, especially for our broader MS applicants, you want to explore audio, video, writing, investigative, whatever it is. Um, that you're really interested in doing journalism, no matter what medium or subject matter it might turn out to be. So we want to know that journalism is really what you want to do. And just conveying that in those essays will be really important because we want to make sure that if you are admitted to the school and you get here, you're happy about the curriculum you're going to be um, put into uh, because we are going to treat you like a journalist in our master's programs from day one.
Um, and you can let us know why you're drawn to this profession of journalism. Even if you're new to it, we have a lot of people who apply to our MS programs who are new to journalism, as David mentioned, who are you know, people who might be career changers, maybe people who studied totally different things up till now. Maybe you studied economics or chemistry or pre-med, and now you want to do journalism, or you've been a teacher, or you've been working in a nonprofit or a for-profit institution, and you want to get into journalism. That's all great. We want to know why, though, journalism at this time in your life is what you want to do. And tell us again about experiences or issues or individuals or works of journalism that have shaped or motivated you, especially towards working in this particular profession. And um, make an impression in these essays, because we won't, again, get the sense of who you are, because we won't have those interviews. But give us a sense of your voice, give a sense of like, you know, who you are from those essays. So spend a good amount of time just crafting those to make sure that we get a good sense of who you are and why you want to do whatever program you are applying for the school. And I'll cover, <clears throat> um, although Ross covered very well earlier about the recommenders, um, make sure that you ask people again, who you have worked for, or um, they taught your class. Um, in most cases, it can be academic or professional. Um, it really doesn't matter, um, you know, which one you decide to choose, except for the case if you've just graduated recently. Um, from the university, then we do ask at least one of those references um, be academic. Um, but in other cases, you can choose between whether it's academic or professional. Um, again, you want to make sure it's someone that um, have, you've actually worked for, they can talk about your work in detail, they can talk about your potential as a journalist, your potential as a graduate student, all of these things that will um, make a really good, strong recommendation letter. Um, sometimes I get questions about, oh, who should I ask? Um, should I ask someone who's like famous and well-known, but they just know through passing? No, that's not exactly gonna make a really good recommendation letter because they can't talk about you. You know, they can just say, oh, I know this person, take them, they'll do great here. No, we want an actual letter, someone who will take the time to write a couple of paragraphs, even a page about your strengths, what you've done well, um, all those sorts of things that, um, and also make sure that it's someone that knows what your goals are, what your ambitions are. So if it's someone that you have not um, spoken with in a while, make sure you take the time to talk to them. Um, I always recommend if you've already started your application early and you have drafted your essays, let them take a look at it so they have context for when they're drafting their recommendation letters. Well, that's mm -hmm. another key point for start your applications early. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's anything else I can say. Oh, and then also act, just be honest. Ask them if they can write a letter, if they have the time to do it. And most importantly, if they can write a really strong letter on your behalf. That's the key point. Right, because every year, oh no, I was just saying every year we do get those people who um are writing us, you know, applicants writing us in the end of December, being like, you know, this person, I just they wrote to me and I they haven't wrote me back. I don't know if they're available. They haven't said, so you don't want to do that. Be in that situation, it's stressful for everybody. So I would say again, now that it's uh, end of September and there's a couple months uh, until the applications are due to you know, start that ball rolling with them as soon as possible, as David said, and just have those conversations quick, whether it's a in-person chat or an email mm -hmm. chat or a phone call or a Zoom, just get that started. So you can introduce what you wanna do and get them on board or not, and just know who's on board to do the application uh, recommendations as soon as possible. So you just get that part uh, started and then you can move ahead and do all the other pieces yourself. Yep, and then one last tip. It's three that are required, but make sure that you at least start making a list at least four or five people, because there might be someone who will tell you they don't have the time or, um, you know, something might happen. You never know, as Ross said, the holiday is coming up because the deadlines are, you know, in December. So make sure you have like a list. So if someone says no, you can eas easily pivot um, and not be too stressed about that. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then again, kind of reiterating some of the points we've all been making for uh, for work samples. Again, choose the pieces, as David said, that show the depth of your analysis or and your writing and storytelling skills. And so that means if it's written, of course, writing skills, if it's an audio or video clip, just really good, you know, storytelling that you did in whatever medium you were working in. 
And again, for especially for MA applicants, we want to see the depth of reporting. Again, for MS applicants, don't feel like um, discouraged if you don't have like really strong works of journalism necessarily, like multiple sourced works of journalism yet to show us in your application. We understand that people are coming into the MS program without necessarily working in journalism yet. So we do look at, you know, interesting works of, uh, you know, either academic work, other types of professional work um, for that program. Uh, but for the MA applicants, because that does presume that you have done multi-source complex reporting already, show us that in the application. That's the main thing we're going to be looking at in MA applications to see if you're uh, prepared for that program, is that you've done you know, multi-source deep reported works uh, with this more than one source. If you've just done a, say for instance, if you're applying to the MA Arts and Culture program and you only have like an album review that you wrote, it's, you just wrote it yourself about an album you like, that's great. Um, I would say that won't be probably satisfactory for MA applications because we want to see that you reported something. If you wrote if you wrote a review and you spoke to that musician and you spoke to other sources to contextualize the album, that might be a piece that we would say would be strong for an MA program. But if you have just reviewed something, made your, you know, it, you know, interesting opinion about a piece of, uh, you know, music or art, that's great. But I would say for people who don't have reported work yet, um, the MS program might be the best fit uh, because that will give you the opportunity to study areas of journalism like arts, but also teach you all the fundamentals of reporting that you'll need to, to do well in the profession. And one thing we also get questions about for work samples is about recency of them. And so it doesn't matter really if your strongest pieces that you submit are two years old or two weeks old. Some people say like, oh, you know, like I have a really good piece, but it was from like, you know, 2021. Is that okay? So totally. We're not going to look at the date of it and be like, oh, that's a couple of years old. But that's that's expired. You know, that doesn't happen <laughs> for that, like a like a like a carton of milk. It doesn't you know expire for us. So and if you did something really great a couple of weeks ago, upload that. Um, but if your works that you think are your best in terms of representing your abilities are a little older than stuff you might have done in the last few months or weeks or year, uh, don't worry about that. Just submit the work that you feel is your best um, in the application. And then I think I'll go over this, the key submission dates real fast. Um, as we talked about um, earlier, just when we introduced this, you have still a couple months uh, to get applications together for any of our programs, which is the good news. Uh, December 15th will be the deadline for the Master of Science programs, pretty much all of them, except for the dual degree, which will be a little later. But for the full-time, the part-time, the documentary, investigative, all of those programs under MS, um, those are all going to be due in terms of submitting your application by December 15th. Um, and the data journalism degree, in addition to that, will be due um, on December 15th. And the PhD in communications applications will be due on December 15th. So just keep that in mind. It's coming up, you know, pretty soon, still a good amount of time, though. So like a couple months to really spend time on those essays, getting those materials together, asking those recommenders. Uh, for people applying to the Master of Arts program, you'll have a couple more weeks uh, beyond that. So that'll be due January 5th for that particular program for whatever concentration you're applying for. And then finally, as I mentioned, if you're applying to the dual MS in journalism and computer science, only for that one dual degree program, you have until January 15th to complete that application. So those are the deadlines for submitting the materials. Um, and I, I think one thing we didn't note is that for recommender letters, um, we know that because you know people are busy, um, sometimes those can be things where the recommender can still turn that in um, in early January. Still, I think January 10th is usually our, our kind of final date for recommend foundation letters to come in themselves, but for you submitting all of your materials that you control and the fee, that will be that date that we have on the screen right now. And then here's a lightning round of some common application questions. I'll read the first slide. I think David will do the next one. Hopefully this will cover a lot of things we might hear from you about, and then we'll open the chat for a few minutes for some Q&A from the rest of you. So here are a few of the questions we get uh, pretty frequently. The first is, why can't I apply to several Columbia Journalism School degree programs at once. Uh, the answer to that is that we really want to see that you're the, a good fit or that, that our program is the right fit for you. Um, and so if you are applying to say the documentary specialization, we wanna know that that's above and beyond anything else, what you wanna do, what you see yourself doing. So if you say, I want to apply to the MS documentary program, but I also want to be considered for the investigative program and also the data program. Then that shows us that maybe your focus is not, you know, totally primarily in documentary, which is okay. If you have multiple interests, we would say probably the broader MS program is the best fit. Just apply to that. If you have multiple interests, you don't need to declare one specialization if you don't feel like you have one. But if you feel like you want to be an investigative journalist uh, above and beyond, apply to the investigative specialization. If you're still waffling between several areas of journalism, again, MS general program is the best place to apply because, again, a, a strong application to any degree program that is at our school shows that you really want to do only that one degree program. 
So if you are asking for multiple programs at once, it shows that you're still up in the air um, and that's cool. Apply to the broader program, which is very flexible, allows you to explore various aspects of the profession. But if you're, yeah, already wanting to market boxes for multiple degrees, then you can talk to us, you know, schedule a chat, come to our drop-in hours, learn more about each program first and really figure out which one you really want to be in. But because we want to know that you want to be, you, that you'd be happy, say, in the documentary specialization, we want to know that's really what you want to do above and beyond anything else. Um, same for investigative, same for the data program, same for any of the MA arts and culture. MA, MA um, concentrations, whether it's arts and culture, business, uh, politics, or science. We just want to know that you have that focus and that we can make you fulfilled uh, with that particular degree program that you would be potentially admitted for. And then uh, another question, of course, what makes it for a strong MS application? As David and I have talked about, MS does not presume that you necessarily have done journalism before. So it does take people from a broad range of backgrounds, from people from all over the world, all over the US, from all sorts of educational institutions and majors, from all sorts of professions that they've done before this. So we really just want to see an MS application, especially in those essays and the, and the recommendation letters, that you have that motivation, that you have that real interest in doing journalism if it's new to you or if it's something you've done a bit of before, that you really want to go deeper into it. Because our programs, as our um, you know alumni and our students will tell you, are intensive. Uh, you will be going out and doing journalism from day one throughout your entire time here through graduation. So we want to know that you're kind of interested in that type of experience where you'll be treated like a professional journalist in New York City right away in our program. So if you're interested in that, um, and if you're new to journalism, that's great. Uh, we just want to hear in the application, especially in the essays, and from what your recommenders tell us that you really want to go out there, you really are curious, you really want to explore you know, issues by going out and talking to people. Uh, we just want to know that. Um, so we know that if you are in our MS programs, you'll be um, you know, happy to be put in a situation where you're going to be asked to do journalism as a real journalist throughout your time um, at Columbia. And then a question for the strong, uh, what makes for a strong MS documentary or investigative specialization or for the MS and data journalism application, kind of exactly what I told you um, moments ago about what why you can't apply to several degree programs at once. We want to know that if you have these choices in front of you and you have this broader MS where you can do a wide range of things under that, that if you are applying to a specialized program that you really want to spend the majority of your time at Columbia doing uh, that specialized area of journalism. So explain to us in that third essay um, about why it is that given in the broader programs that you want to go more into a focused program in investigative, in documentary, or data journalism, and why. And even if you're new to that uh, area of journalism, that's great too. But why do you want to spend time only kind of really focusing on making a documentary film as your master's project in the doc program, or doing an investigative master's project in the in the investigative program, or doing a data related reporting, uh, you know, master's project in the data program. So we want to see that strong interest in that specific area if you have it, if you're applying to a specialized program. And again, what makes for a strong MA application? Again, repeating ourselves a bit, but MA again, presumes that you have done professional journalism already. That's kind of required um, in terms of being um, an eligible candidate for the MA. So that means, again, that what you um, are showing us in the application is, you, is that you know how to do multi-source complex reporting already. As David said, we usually look for people who are three years or more in the professional journalism world. We have made exceptions for people who have maybe just finished college recently, but they have done a lot of advanced journalism in their undergraduate career. It's going to be really the samples that you provide that are going to make us kind of understand your um, potential for the MA program even more than the years. So um, if you're looking at what you can provide as work samples, and if you don't have any multi-sourced reported articles or no report reported articles at all, I would say the MA is probably less likely the right fit at this time and to apply to the MS program. But if you have reported work that shows some complexity, multi-source reporting, then the MA application uh, is maybe what you should do. Um, and definitely the MA uh, welcomes people who might be new to whatever concentration area you're applying for. We sometimes hear questions like, I'm applying to the MA business concentration, but I've never done business journalism. I've done political journalism. Is that okay? Totally okay. You don't need to have a strong background in the concentration area that you're applying to for the MA necessarily. You could totally choose a new area of journalism uh, that you've never really reported in before for the MA. That's great. We'll teach you how to really report deeply in whatever subject area, but we do expect that you've already done multi-source reporting. So we need to see that in the application uh, above, and ab ab above and beyond all other things in the application for that program. 
For the PhD application, this is trickier. It's a small program. So around four students a year join the PhD cohort every year. So we really want to know, and it's kind of a complex conversation. We'll actually have a PhD webinar this Monday, October 2nd, for people interested in learning more about it. The PhD program, because it is a many-year academic uh, program, we want to know that your particular research interest will be best suited by our particular faculty and the faculty that are around Columbia, because it's a multidisciplinary program um, that, you know, whatever your research is, it can be a wide range of research interest when it comes to the study of media and communications, but does it make sense that you come here and work with our particular faculty with their knowledge and their expertise? Um, so definitely research the faculty we have here that teach in the PhD and make a case if you're applying to the PhD for why Columbia's PhD in communications program is really the right fit for what you want to research. Again, it's really how it best serves you. We want to know that we're going to serve you best um, as opposed to like, you know, are you good enough for Columbia? It's really, are we the right program for you in terms of how we look at those applications? Um, again, reiterating what David had talked about earlier, are there TOEFL or IELTS waivers? No, uh, very extremely rarely. We will probably very, very rarely grant those. So it's good to, to just schedule those now. I know that we, you know, have a pretty strict TOEFL waiver, a TOEFL rule, a TOEFL IELTS rule for PhD applicants and master's applicants. So if you don't meet the criteria to not to not have to take the IELTS or the TOEFL, just schedule that and get that straightened away because we will, you know, no matter what time you're contacting us in the fall, likely tell you you're going to have to take the TOEFL or IELTS if you fall into those categories, as David explained. Um, we also get questions about application fee waivers for the application. We don't offer those waivers at this time. So um, these be prepared to make that payment in order to make the uh, application complete and allow us to review the application uh, once uh, the submission dates are due. Uh, another question, uh, David mentioned this earlier, uh, what do I do with work samples in other languages? So if you have um, you know, written samples in newspapers or magazines or in schools in other languages, you can translate that yourself into English if you're able to do that. Um, just do it yourself. Um, if you need to have somebody else do that, that's fine or a service. Um, if you have a sample in another, a, a multimedia sample in another language, so an audio or a video sample, if you can provide either subtitles in the video clip or if you can write up a transcript in English of whatever the audio file was and provide that as an upload in English, um, that would be satisfying for us. To, uh, to be able to see what the English language you know, translation is for those work samples. So you can do that too. We do ask that recommendation letters, this is not a question uh, on the chart here, but be in English too. So if your recommender can't write it in English, um, they could either you know, have that, be able to do that themselves, hopefully uh, translate it themselves in English, or I guess if they need to have a service do that, as long as they you know, are um, you know, official uh, transcriptions of that, that they approve, um, they can you know, sign off on that and upload it themselves. Um, that would be okay. Um, and do you need to provide a transcript for a one class summer program? We get those questions and we went over that before. Yes, if you just took like say one, one off class, Maybe like in a summer, we're in your college career. Um, maybe you learned a language. Maybe you learned uh, chemical engineering for a summer semester, and you didn't follow through on that. After that, we do still want the transcript. We want to see the the grade or the mark you received in that. So you will need to upload that. So it's just good to get that done now. And then, as David went over earlier, um, the question: Can I upload or link to longer work samples and are requested? The answer is yes, but just know, as David said, if it's like more than three minutes, if it's ten minutes, if it's thirty minutes, if it's an hour, that the committee will likely just you know watch or listen to maybe just three minutes or so of that. So if you can edit it to the point the the sample you really want them to look at or or listen to, that's the best strategy. Um, but if you do upload a longer one, just know that they may check out after a certain amount of time. Um, and so if the best part of whatever that sample is, is later in it, maybe just excerpt that piece um, and make sure that they listen or, or look at that now. And David, over to you. <clears throat> Thanks, Ross. Um, so more common questions we get, if I admit it to the MS, can I request to change into a specialized program like investigative or document uh, documentary later? It's not likely. Um, so I, I would recommend think long and hard about the application program that fits the person, the career goals that you have, the type of training that you want to get from um, attending graduate school. Think hard about what, what you want to learn and what you want to do um, so that when you apply, you apply directly to that specific program because the likelihood of changing into a different program after you've been admitted is not likely. Mm -hmm. uh, next, can I switch if admitted from full-time to part-time? Um, it depends. Uh, that has happened in the past in special cases. If we, if there's space for students to switch from full-time to part-time and vice versa, 
Um, but again, if you think about the program that's a best fit for you and apply to that degree program. Um, so that's a maybe. Sometimes we have been able to um, allow students to switch after they were admitted, and sometimes we weren't able to accommodate that. Um, but make sure you apply for the program that best fits your your needs and your goals at that moment. And we'll try to work with you. Um, you know, if you're admitted, let us know early if that's the case. Um, so maybe on that question. Um, next, why can't most international applicants apply to the part-time MS? The reason for that is because for a student visa, you are required to work. Uh, sorry, to be um, in a degree program full time. So that's the that's the stipulation. That's not a Columbia rule, but that's a rule that's um, put in place by the Department of Education. So in most cases, that is not going to work. There are some very rare extreme cases where if there's a student who's already in the US um, and they're on a work visa, completely different from a student visa, and they're able to stay in the US longer, um, that has happened. But if you are gonna be on a student visa, you have to be in a full-time program. So that's why if you're an international student, it's likely you'll have to apply, you will have to apply to the full-time and not have the option for the part-time program. In what cases should I apply to the MA and also mark the box of being considered for the MS? I think Ross covered that pretty well um, from the other page. But if you um, have a few years of experience, maybe you don't have the three to five, but um, you know you just finished your undergraduate, but you've done really, uh, really um, um, complex um, stories, then you could check the box to make sure you give yourself that option. But if the faculty take a look the admissions committee takes a look at your application um, and they see that you've done really good work, um, but they just not quite ready yet for the MA program, then you could still be considered for the MS. So in those cases, you would check the box, but that also means that you would also have to take writing tests. So you will get a notification from us if you check the box around November that you have to take the writing test. And Ralph talked about that in pretty much pretty good detail before. So again, to the last question, am I automatically considered for uh, Columbia Journalism School, that's what CGS is, scholarship when I submit my application for admission? The answer to that is no. There's a separate application for the scholarship aid. So that's very important. That's one of the probably main things that if you take anything away from this webinar, we'll also have additional webinars. We'll talk about the educational financing part. Um, so stay tuned for more information about that coming up. But the answer to that is no. You have to submit your admissions application and your scholarship aid application to be eligible for funding from Columbia. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So I think I have to pop out to actually host another session. But David, would you mind taking like five minutes or so to do a Q&A with the group? Sure. And then I can I, do about five minutes and I have another um, session actually after this, but I can do about five minutes. Okay, cool. Thank you, David. So we'll turn on the chat. You just will probably answer a few questions today. And then again, you can come to our drop-in hours uh, anytime for that. And then I'll put in the chat to um, our video from, I think I have this here. Oh, maybe not. Uh, but check our YouTube page where you can see our webinar last week about what program is right for you if you have questions about that, which will help you kind of determine how to craft your application. So great. Um, let's see. So host. All right. So David, I am going yes. to pop out and then okay. I will see the rest of you, I hope, soon at another event. Uh, thank you for all these great questions. And again, if we don't get to your questions today, we will uh, be able to chat uh, many times each week if you want to come to our drop-ins.